I couldn't get a job w in a bookstore. Um, not that I, I didn't try that hard, but I, I just didn't have the. Well, what, what period of time is it? This is 1970, okay. early 70. So in, I finally borrowed some money, took my dissertation books. A lot of, I had a lot of books at that time on Peru, and it did my first catalog in 1973. And it was rough going in the yeah. beginning, yeah. like everybody yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I must say that I could not imagine then or now any other any other job. Yeah. So we've been in it now 30. Five years. Yeah. And um, we've always majored in Latin America, which has involved a lot of travel and a lot of contacts and all that. And we, we have moved in different directions, though, than we did in the first. First, it was purely antiquarian, mm -hmm. but not even great antiquarian, just academic scholarly right. books. And as time went on, we went into more and more better grade, and finally, we're moving more towards unique items. When you say we, Howard, my wife, you're, you're Beverly was yeah, with you from the beginning on this. No, not the beginning. She came in in the '80s, and um, she's really the heart and soul of it now. Well, she's the computer person, isn't she? She's everything. Well, I'll, well, yes, I've got to know that. But <laughs> she's everything. She's um, she she does a lot with the blankets. We have a lot of blankets to provide major universities, including the Library of Congress with art and architecture from Latin America. And uh, that's been our major breadwinner. As far as the OP and antiquarian, we still do it, but we only do it in a non-traditional way, artist uh. books from Latin America, um, original material, Try very much indigenous stuff. Um, when you first started in the book business, were there anybody, any dealers who were like mentors or, or who helped you uh, get, get going? Well, Jake Zeitlin a bit. He, he encouraged me. But um, I wasn't successful for Jake. I tried to sell some of his books, but <laughs> I said, I can get it cheaper from Jake. Why should I pay you a premium? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds right. <laughs> so, but Jake was a very, he was very good to me. He always encouraged me. In fact, when I first started, he sent me a card saying, I wish you the best of luck. I enjoyed your first catalog. And so, uh, so he was sort of. It's a real gentleman is what he was. He was a gentleman. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Um, your your uh, affiliation with Jake, was it a long one or a short one? Was he, uh, was he a, a friend of yours for a long time, a supporter, or, or no. just, just, a, just a starter guy? Just a starter guy. but. Well, I had no mentors. Really? Because nobody really dealt in my field. That's true. That's true. And um, there were some dealers around, minor dealers in Brazil or Louisiana. Mm -hmm. But um, we were sort of breaking new ground in a way. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And um, what's happened is because of over the years, there's been more and more growth in the area because of the literature boom. They, they use the word boom, in fact. Yeah, the um, the growth in art books and especially architecture, and the interest in the older Incunabula from Mexico, for instance, and the older documents and things from colonial times. Mm -hmm. um, we all are caught up in the internet revolution. Which uh, one? I'm sorry. We're all caught up in the internet revolution. Oh, yes. um, what? aspects of the book business have changed since the internet. Has it been good? Has it been bad? Has it been ugly? No. I think the big change has made academic books almost impossible to carry because they everybody puts it as it puts it five dollars cheaper than the next guy. It's constantly it's changing. Constantly changing. So what used to be a good fifty dollar book, seventy five dollar book, is now a ten or twenty dollar book. So we don't handle that at all. Right. In fact we're just we're just having a big sale discounting everything 50% to, on, to on get it out get it out because we don't want to we don't want to mingle in that now what we do do is we do internet a lot of internet with our art and architecture 
and we're starting a new project uh, called Anaconda Books, it's another corporation, which um, we're going to try and promote the sale directly from the publishers to the clients. Uh -huh. So there's. And you guys do that through the internet? Yeah. E-commerce. E-commerce. Yeah. What about the other side of the coin? Do you buy much on the internet? Only what we have firm demand. A firm want from a university or something, we'll buy it. Okay. But most of our buying is done in the book fairs down in Argentina, Colombia, Chile, and especially Mexico. There's two or three major fairs. We do them all. And they're very successful for you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because we buy, they're not OP now. Yeah. We're buying new books. As I say, we're shifting away from the OP except original material, mm -hmm. which we get from people on the street in Mexico City. We have an office there. Oh. So we have an office there, and we also have employees in all countries, or semi-employees, they are part-time. Yeah, but they, they are the ones who, who scout out the material yeah. for you? especially Chile. Argentina and uh, Brazil. Have you found the internet has brought you some new customers? Oh, overwhelmingly. Overwhelmingly. Yes. Um, customers you probably would have never. No, because they're most of them are abroad. Yeah. They're Europe, some Asian, but mostly Europe. When you when you talk about um, internet customers, are they for the most part one shot deals, or are they? Oh, let's get get your drink down there. Are they one shot deals oh. or repeaters? I can't answer that because I don't keep track of who, who our internet customers are. Okay. But we've, it's led to many universities, foreign universities, uh -huh. coming on board. Well, that's interesting. Because they see us as a source for, the, for their demands for Latin American material. Right. Um, talk a little bit about how easy or difficult it was to transition your business into uh, when the computer revolution started. <laughs> we were very early. I know you were. It was very early. I remember. Our first computer was a Corona, I think, <laughs> and the Corona blew up. <laughs> <laughs> and man, one megabyte, I couldn't get over it. One megabyte of, of uh, storage was uh, 2000 or $2,500, and I'll never forget, one megabyte. Yeah. It's a lousy thing. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, we went through all the pains that everybody goes through, all the programming and all that. We've been doing it since about 1975, 76. So you were rather early. Yeah, we were very early. Very early into it. See, I always thought, I always would go into these shops, the computer shops, and I'd say, look, I want a plan where I can press a button, <laughs> you know, and they give me this information, and they'd shake their heads, are you crazy? Yeah. But over time, it happened. It's, it's it, yeah. Some people have put together some damn good programs. Yeah, we're, we're forming now a very, very, very extensive and complicated in three languages program for our Anaconda books. Mm -hmm. um, if you were entering the book trade today, Howard, would you enter the book trade? Yes. Or, yeah. And how would you approach? Would you approach the book business the same way you did, or would no? You'd have to approach it from a different angle, wouldn't you? I would approach it from a different angle. I would do a lot more with photography. Photography. Well, it's always hot. So that's the hot thing. Well, it is. It be a lot of people have entered in it to it, but I would go photography. I would definitely go um, artist books, which we're doing now. I would try and find corners, niches, that weren't commonly approached. We would also do, of course, the art and architecture. Is, is yeah, it's a staple. Yeah, we do music, we do cinema, we do um, dance, uh, because we have clients for it. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you perceive as the greatest challenges facing the book trade in the decades ahead? biggest challenge for a dealer is to find a niche where he has some degree of being competitive. I think there's so much in generally of the same thing, same books. Now I'm not talking about the high end books. Yeah. But I'm talking in general. You have to find a niche. That's why I advise anybody that is a dealer. Find a place, find something that you really like and that has a little bit of appeal beyond the normal stream of uh, 
Um, well, how do you feel about the ABAA as an organization continuing on, or do you think at some point it's just going to not exist anymore? I think it's a great organization. I have no, no complaints, except I think the fares are going to be on the reach of a lot of the dealers that would like to participate. You mean the cost-wise? Yeah, cost wise. cost I think the cost-wise is a major problem. I think six thousand dollars, five to six thousand dollars for a booth means you have to sell ten or twelve thousand just to make break even, not including your airfare. Yeah. That's why we only do the airfare. We don't do the big fares in New York or Boston. You just can't do it because yeah. I think there's it excludes a lot of good dealers that have very nice stock that fit niches but they can't they don't want to put out that kind of money. Yeah, I can't really blame them sometimes. It's I can't either. It's an expensive proposition. Uh, following up on that with about the book fairs, what percentage do you think of your business is book fair oriented and what percentage is internet oriented? Just off the top of your head if you can come yeah, up with the a book fair, you know, we do thirty, fifty thousand, that's fine. So it's small, very small. Maybe five percent. But so, but do you do the LA fair as an exposure type thing? Yes. Just so, yes, so people know you're still here. And well, well, no, because we get all the universities that we deal with come in person. Ah. And we, we renew contacts and we sell them material that we save especially for the fair for you. So you do put things aside. Yeah, we do a lot with universities. Yeah. That's our biggest customer. Um. When it's all said and done, uh, I look at the trade and I see uh, a bunch of people over 50, and I see a, a few people under 40. Good and, observation. And to me, the future of the trade really rests with the under 40, not with the over 50. Exactly. Where are we heading? Well, I'm 77, and my wife is in her 60s. So we only have, what, 10, 15 years more? At well, least. <laughs> hopefully. But it's a problem. And to find, I, I have six children, six very successful children. Not one of them wanted to enter the book fair. They said, it's too much damn work for what you get. And they were right. <laughs> of course they're right. <laughs> because the, we live, we all, most dealers, I'm not saying there aren't exceptions, but most dealers don't make a lot of money. They make, they survive, they have a good life. Don't make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. We don't make, I mean, yes, we know we know the biggies, but in general, no. Well, the average bookseller is is just an average bookseller. I just mean. an average middle class yeah. earner. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's very difficult to, to crack those big <coughs> barriers with a lot of money behind you. Yeah, and we're not a business that banks love. No. <laughs> As I have found out. <laughs> yeah, we're we're uh, we're just not that profitable. No, I, we make our 10 and 20 percent a year. We're, we're doing good. Well, if you were to give one single piece of advice to a young bookseller who comes to you and says, Mr. Cano, uh, please advise me, what should I do coming into the book business? What is the one major thing Find I should do? Find a niche. Find a niche. And elaborate a little that on that. Find a subject that you really are passionate about that especially the, the books of that, or the manuscripts and or whatever, photos, whatever, that you feel is something you could want to pursue for at least many years and develop your knowledge, and develop your clientele that isn't a common, in other words, don't, I would advise not to be a generalist. Mm -hmm. I would advise finding some subject in that is attracted to them, whether whatever it may be, it might nat natural is it natural history, it could be petroleum. I don't care what it is. I mean, there's one man I understand that makes money off ice books dealing with ice. To each his own. To each his own. Yeah, <laughs> but whatever it is, try to find something that's really you can focus down on, and then you can always elaborate a bit. You can always expand. When you start out, you want to get a name as that the guy who does this or yeah. that. That's what my advice would be. Well, that's great. Thanks very much, Howard. You're welcome. Enjoyed it a lot. Don't escape with our, don't escape with our stuff. Jim Pepper tried to walk off with our... <laughs>